Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, approximately one out of five teens has a mental health disorder diagnosable by clinical methods and nearly one third shows symptoms of depression. Now you might be thinking, well, many teens seem depressed to me. Their moods and their emotions are all over the place. Stress is overwhelming. Yes, that can be true. Symptoms of depression in adolescents aren't always easy to identify because they often appear as normal adolescent behavior. But if we keep an eye open for consistent depressed behavior and indicators like fatigue and changes in sleep patterns, changes in eating patterns, social withdrawal or anger, these can serve as early warning signs that can allow us to get help for our teens as depression is absolutely treatable, but not fixable if you just leave it alone. Teens who have depression need therapy, support at home, and yes, some also need medication. There's no quick fix, and thankfully, we have Katie Hurley here to explain how when we know that our child needs help, how we can get help, what we need to do, and how we can assist them at home, what exercises, tools we can use to help them improve their mood, their self-esteem, and their motivation. Katie Hurley LCSW, is a child and adolescent psychotherapist, parenting expert, and writer. She is the founder of Girls Can Empowerment Groups for Girls between the ages of 5 and 11. Hurley is the author of the Happy Kid Handbook, No More Mean Girls, both subjects we have interviewed Katie on previously on how to talk to kids about anything, and a new workbook called The Depression Workbook for Teens, which... I'd like to brag for my friend and colleague for a moment, is the number one new release on Amazon for teen and young adult self-esteem and self-reliance issues. Her work can be found in the Washington Post, PBS Parents, US News and World Report, among other places. She practices psychotherapy in the South Bay area of Los Angeles and earned her BA in psychology and women's studies from Boston College and her MSW from the University of Pennsylvania. She splits her time between California and Connecticut with her husband and two children. I am so thrilled to have you back on the show again. So welcome back, Katie, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Thank you so much for having me back. You're one of my favorites. Oh, you're the best. And thank you so much for putting How to Talk to Kids About Anything as a parenting resource in the back of your new book. I was really, I just was reading along, like completely unbeknownst to me that it was there. So when I'm reading the resources and all of a sudden I'm like, podcast for parents and there it is how to talk to kids about anything i'm like ah i turned to my husband i'm like look this is so nice well i feel like you're just you know you're doing great things you bring on so many amazing resources mm-hmm. each episode i just i love it i think you know you cover everything which is fantastic uh, it's been such a joy for me and i i really feel like it's so much fun for me to be highlighting so many great people and great work i i do think of myself as the person who is presenting the entire child development pie and all of these great colleagues just taking the deepest slices out of that pie and explaining it to parents and, ed- and educators in such an uh, applicable way and an accessible way. So I appreciate you. This new book, it's it's really exciting and, and so great for teens. But before we sort of dive in, for those who haven't yet seen this new workbook who, that just came out, can you tell us What gets you up in the morning and what inspired you to focus on depression and teens in this newest book? Well, first of all, I want to get this out of the way and say that, you know, despite the title of the book, your teen doesn't need a diagnosis of depression Mm -hmm. to benefit from it. There you go. Mm -hmm. I really wrote it in a way to help. You know, we know that 
teen stress right now is sort of at hit unprecedented levels. So kids are really struggling to cope with any variety of stressors on any given day. So I wanted to give them a resource where they can kind of explore some of that stuff, learn some coping skills, figure out, am I feeling depressed? Am I actually depressed? Or am I just feeling a little bit depressed some days? And if I am, what do I do about that? So, you know, when my publisher asked me to write this book, I was a little nervous at first, to be honest, because it, teens don't necessarily go out looking for books for themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought, well, how am I going to get it <laughs> to the people who mm -hmm. need it? Um, but I was inspired to write it because I have worked with so many teens over the last 20 plus years. And I am seeing those stress levels rise like right before my eyes in my office every single day. And kids, they I find that teens today are really motivated they're really smart. They want to make a difference. They want to make healthy changes in their lives. Um, you know, they're fighting for big things like like uh, the environment and gun sense and women's rights. And they're fighting for small things like, you know, how do I get my life together and get to school every day and cope with all this stress that I'm dealing with? So I think they're really motivated and they just sometimes need a little bit of guidance. And with the right guidance, we can kind of step back and let them take the wheel and they really learn how to help themselves. Mm -hmm. I think all of what you're saying is important. I think that by telling us that, yes, it is for kids who may be clinically depressed, but also for kids who really are maybe just feeling a whole array of feelings and want to explore them and want to help to boost their self-esteem, this book is for you too. So anybody who's listening who works with teens or has teens, this might be a wonderful resource for that. And you, you introduce your book with some help in understanding how depression is different from normal ups and downs of teen life. And you say that depression is when feelings be so, become so intense, you feel helpless and hopeless, and clinical depression can take over your life. So for those parents and educators who are listening, can you help us understand sort of the difference between those two things? Like what should we be looking for that's sort of alarming or red flags that we may, should be looking for versus what seems sort of normal undulations of teen life? Well, this is one of the most difficult parts about teen depression because it, the teenage years are fraught with up and downs, you know, and that's kind of normal. They go through a lot of stuff. They have a lot on their plates. Um, they, you know, then we have the whole issue of hormones and growth and change and brain development. And it's kind of like this big giant soup of stuff happening inside their brains on any given day. And so it can be hard to weed out, well, what's just a bad day versus what's actually a problem. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the hallmarks of a clinical depression is that it lasts for two weeks or more. Mm -hmm. So with adults, the other thing that's tricky is with adults, they always say, and the way they portray it in movies and on television, even on sort of teen television, is that depression looks like very, 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 very sad, crying all the time, mm -hmm. can't get out of bed. But for teenagers, a lot of times they have an incredible capacity to get themselves out of bed, but then they're really angry and irritable and they're having these giant meltdowns and blow ups and they seem to come from out of nowhere and you can't really track what exactly is going on. Well, that's the depression talking. So a lot of times we warn parents to look for irritability that lasts a long time or that crops up daily over, you know, two weeks or more. Because that's not normal. You know, mm. it's, it's normal for teens to have an outburst once in a while. It's not normal to have one every single day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're kind of looking at duration, length of time that it's happening. Um, and then, you know, other red flags are, you know, it's normal for teens to sometimes just need to check out a little bit and be on their own and hang out in their room and do their own thing. But if your teen is really isolating him or herself regularly. They're starting to reject their friends or their friends are rejecting them for some reason and they're completely isolated and they're not talking and they appear like they're shutting down. Well, those are some pretty big red flags. You know, I always say to parents, you know your kids mm -hmm. the best. They are going to change a little bit in adolescence, but still you have to do that gut check and trust yourself. If something's not right, if something seems like something's not right, you're probably correct. Mm -hmm. And it's best to get it assessed than to wait on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we're, you know, normally seeing our child who is an early riser or they are, you know, eating a certain amount, but then all of a sudden there's sort of a change that they're 
sleeping so much more or they're eating so much more or so much less, you know, whatever the norm is for your child, when it sort of changes dramatically for an extended period of time, that would be something where we would say, oh, maybe we need to get this checked out. Is that correct? Right, exactly. Okay. okay. All right. So, so there are people who are listening today who are probably thinking right now, this resonates with me. Maybe, maybe this is something that I need to get checked. Or maybe they've recently said to themselves, their child is showing some of those red flags. And as a parent, you want to help. And clearly, you want to do it as soon as possible. Whether your child is, is depressed or is seeming like, they're going through something and they and you say, oh, a, a workbook like this would be helpful. What would be the conversation that you might have with that child so that they understand what's going on with their brain and their body and and how they might be able to help themselves right now? Because it feels like, hey, here's this workbook, by the way, see you later. It's probably not the best m- mode of, of, <laughs> of getting that done. So so what, what would you, like, what is the conversation we can have with our kids that show that we are understanding of them, that we want to help, and that they can get help? Well, I mean, one quick story before I dive into that. Oh, I like stories. A mom, <laughs> a mom shared with me that she had pre-ordered the book, and, and I knew her in childhood, so this we go back a long way, but she had pre-ordered the book for one of her teens, and she put it on the counter, on the kitchen counter, and when her teenager came home from school, she was kind of been nervous all day. Was this going to be a good thing, or was this going to be the thing that caused the next blow-up? Mm-hmm. So she kind of was on edge all day, you know, waiting for her child to get home. Her teenager gets home, and sees it and starts flipping through it. And she said to me, she sent me this really beautiful message. And she said, I just want you to know that she opened it up and she's flipping through it. And I was worried that I would see anger. And what I saw was hope oh. and feeling understood. Nice. And she's like, and I, and then I felt so relieved. And I think she felt a little relieved. And then we were able to talk about it like, hey, you're not the only one. And here's this great resource. So we can do it together or you can do it on your own. But, you know, I, I just wanted to get it for you. And, and she just felt like, you know, her teenager felt really relieved that finally she was fe- being understood. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, these things are hard to talk about. And because teenagers, you know, like, let's be honest, we walk on eggshells around them right. because we don't know how they're going to respond exactly. to things. It, it yes. can always go either way, even under the best circumstances. So I think one thing to do is to really just normalize it. And we have to be better listeners than we are talkers. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, parents tend to talk a lot. (laughs) And we tend to have a lot of answers because we're good at stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to really focus on listening. And so what you know, what I've been saying to parents who are saying, asking me this exact question, well, how do I introduce this to my kids is just say, you know, I heard about this great resource, and you may like it, and you may not like it. But it feels to me, and maybe I'm totally wrong, but it feels to me like, um, you know, you seem a little lonely lately, or you seem like you don't really want to be with your friends, or just something seems different, and I'm here for you. So whatever you want to tell me, I'm here for you. That's all I'm going to say. You know, you can flip through this or don't, or we can save it for later, but I just wanted you to know that I'm thinking of you, and if something's going on, I'm here to listen, and I I won't even talk. I'll just sit here and listen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's enough to really open up the conversation. And then, you know, in terms of talking to them about their brains and what's happening, that comes later. You know, the first step with teenagers is we got to open that door. You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's only open a tiny crack, and we really need to widen that crack, and then we can start helping them. Without sticking our whole self in and going, I'm here, talk to me now. <laughs> yes. Right, right. right. Well, we always come at them at the wrong time. Exactly. You know, they've been surviving school all day and yes. we're like, we've got 20 questions and that's the worst time to, you of know, course. to, to get a bunch of questions. But to be honest, sometimes they come at us the wrong time. It's like one yep. o'clock in the morning and by the way, I'm ready to talk now or I'm divided <laughs> yeah. in three different directions and hey, how about now while you're cooking dinner and you're also helping somebody with their homework. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, right. the timing is not always good on any side. But, right. um, you know, I often say 
cries for help don't wait for a hole in our schedule. So no. uh, it's <laughs> you got to take it when you can. I always remember, do you remember from years ago, the drop everything and read campaign? Mm-hmm. I always think of it that way now, like yeah. drop everything and talk. Like if they're yes. ready, then just drop everything yeah, and just, talk. Yeah, no, <laughs> just leave dinner alone. Yeah. And yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, so important. Yes, absolutely. So some of the areas that you mentioned in the book are incredibly practical, that there are things that that our kids can change, that we can change with some effort and commitment. I'm not saying it's like, oh, no problem, but you can change it as soon as possible. And I'm talking about our eating, uh, what we do before bed, um, maybe some exercises that we do or activities we do, who we spend time with. Can you talk about some of these really practical areas, what we can help our kids to be doing that can elevate their mood? And it's just simply just changing some of those key things like eating, sleeping, or activity level. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one thing that's really exciting about depression research right now is this idea of how does our food affect our brains mm-hmm. and what can we do differently to improve our moods? And they are finding connections between the foods we put into our body and the way our, it affects our moods. So um, it's really important to talk to teens about that and help them. So I have a whole section dedicated to that because, you know, you hear little snippets, oh, the Mediterranean diet is best and this is best and that is best. Well, you know, the truth is we have to limit our processed foods, right? Making our own foods is always going to be better than pre-made foods. Mm-hmm. And not to say that we never eat pre-made foods because that's completely unrealistic. Mm-hmm. And so we like everything else. It's a matter of balance. But when we're really thinking about putting those good omega-3s and, you know, just nuts and seeds and mm-hmm. avocados yes. and fresh vegetables and all this stuff, when we eating like anything else is a habit. So, the more we eat healthy foods, the more we crave healthy foods. The problem is we're all busy and running on empty. And so we get into the habit of grabbing on the go and eating what we can eat in the car from here to there. And typically those choices are not as healthy. You know, it's really hard to eat a quinoa bowl while you're driving a car or <laughs> putting on your cleats, you know? So <laughs> you know, absolutely, we're not making the best choices because we're on the go. So it becomes a matter of really, and this I think is where parents get overwhelmed and I get it because I get overwhelmed yes. and I only have two kids. Yes. So, you know, but trying to figure out how do we find the time yeah. to have these healthy foods, you know, sometimes meal prepping in advance really can help, you know, making some things on a Sunday that can function as lunches throughout the week that are healthier choices. Um, But really focusing on those whole foods and those healthy foods and, you know, and then mixing it up, of course, with with our favorites sometimes because we got to enjoy our lives and, and, you know, you can't Mm -hmm. live on quinoa alone. Mm -hmm. So I mean, but as really good as quinoa that. is, but we're not, it, it, we're yeah. not like Gwyneth Paltrow and <laughs> no we're just like have quinoa. everything yeah. done for us. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, oh, I just have this perfectly done quinoa bowl all right. waiting for me in my refrigerator. <laughs> you know, and we don't have to like stress ourselves out with making everything. I mean, you can buy really well-made hummus that's yes. just three ingredients. So you don't need to make your own hummus, right. you know. You right, can buy right. the good hummus and that's a good healthy snack with some carrots, right? right? So, you know, don't totally overhaul your whole life. You have to think about your own brain and, mm-hmm. you know, how much stress you can take. Right. Um, yeah, you want to add stress. That's what we're right. trying to take but away. We can make healthier choices in terms of what we eat. And then, you know, we know that sleep is essential for the teenage brain. And we also know that most teenagers are not getting nearly enough sleep. And they really do need to get about, you know, eight to nine hours a night. And most are probably getting six to seven. And so that's a significant deficit and that will tank their moods and also ramp up anxiety. Mm. So that's a terrible combination for teenagers who are already coping with stress. Um, You know, one thing that's complicated is that the teenage brain does want to stay up a little bit later and sleep a little bit later and that doesn't fit into the school schedule. Right, (laughs) exactly. You know, they end up kind of oversleeping on weekends. Well, that completely mixes up their circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole process of what can you do to get yourself to bed earlier at night? You can train yourself to go to bed a little bit earlier. Right. It's hard. Um, it's a matter of figuring out a calming routine that works for each teenager. They're all different. We can't let technology interfere with our sleep. We're all doing it. Adults are guilty of it as well. So that kind of, for me, I always suggest that that needs to be a family overhaul. Mm-hmm 
in terms of getting the technology out of our bedrooms and preserving our sleep and creating calming sleep spaces. Meditation is known to help kids at night um, fall asleep a little bit better. Some simple yoga stretches before bed can be really calming and help work out those kinks and the last bits of stress and anxiety before bed at night. Um, so if we really just think about, you know, it's funny because when kids are little, when they're preschool, toddlers, even elementary school, we have these very rigid bedtime routines yes. that we follow, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden they become teenagers and the whole thing goes haywire, huh. you know? And then we get to be adults and we're back to the rigid routine right. because we want to get enough sleep. So Exactly. Sleep is so important. We Not only do we think it's important, we just like relish in it. Like, yay. Right. <laughs> we can never get enough of it. Yes. So, you know, I think with teenagers, the trick is empowering them to create mm -hmm. the system that works for them. They right. don't like to be told what to do. They are told what to do all day long, every day. So instead of giving them the routine that we think is going to work, sitting down with them and having them tell us what they think is going to work and what they think they need to change and what can they do. Maybe chamomile tea works for one teenager. Maybe warm milk works for another. When mm -hmm. I was in high school, I drank a mug of warm milk every night before bed. My mom didn't even know. I finished oh, my homework, so sneak downstairs, have my warm milk, and then go to bed. So you know, teenagers will figure out systems that work if we give them the space to do it. Mm -hmm. We're just always harping on the things that we're scared of, like mm -hmm. technology. No kidding, no kidding. But you do agree that we should have the technology out of the room. So at least yeah. we're all, yes, that needs to needs to get out of the room so that kids are not looking at who posted what or what yeah. they didn't post or who is messaging them about this, that, and the other thing that doesn't actually matter in the long run um, at two in the morning and then and then they're disrupted for the entire day. So, well, and the YouTube videos, they go down the rabbit hole of oh, yeah. YouTube videos for hours. Right, right. All of a sudden they're, you know, they're watching one thing that their friend posted and all of a sudden they've got one that goes into the next one and the next one and then all of a sudden they're watching like, you know, Grover from Sesame Street at right. three o'clock in the morning. This has nothing to do with anything. So I, I totally get that. I think Not that I've ever done that. No, I'm just like, you know, <laughs> like, why do you know that? Um, <laughs> but it's really the truth. So... One of the areas that we discussed in previous uh, podcasts, even you and I discussed it, um, and we've also discussed it with uh, Lisa Damore, we've discussed it with Rachel Simmons, is this, this thing that's really making the moods of our children go haywire. It's conflict. You know, conflict is, is a big bear for teens. And you say that a key for coping with conflict is learning how to communicate. You can stay calm, state the problem, listen, ask questions, negotiate. So can you help us understand what that would look like or sound like if, for example, a teen is in a conflict with another peer because maybe he or she found out that the other person is spreading private or maybe not completely truthful gossip about that person? Like what, as a parent, how can you help them to deal with that conflict by doing the things you were saying, like stating the problem, listening, asking questions? How does that work? Well, first of all, what I talk to teens about all the time is they've got to learn how to deal with conflict face to face. They've got mm. to take it offline. Um, as my dear friend John Duffy says, Snapchat is kind of the road rage of the social media Ooh, right now. Oh my gosh, what a and, good line. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and he's right. I mean, it's, they use their stories to call out fights. You know, they're, they use their streaks to call out fights. It's, it's alarming what goes on in Snapchat, in text messaging, the screenshots of, you know, someone tries to have a heart to heart over text. Oh. And the screenshots get taken, snippets of them only, and shared in a certain way. And, Ouch. you know, as John Mayer says, when you own the information, you can bend it all you want. So, you know, they change it, right, mm. to fit the narrative that they're trying to portray on Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it is. So mm. one thing is we've got to get back to a place, um, and, and adults too, where we stop relying on technology to solve problems. It's great for checking in. It's great for funny memes. It's great for a laugh, for scheduling coffee date or a podcast. It's not great for solving a problem right. because we can't know what other people are thinking. So that's kind of step one is really guiding our, our teens away from that. They're very stuck on it right now because it's quick and easy. Yes. Um, 
and it and they kind of they tell me all the time that they get into these chats and then they don't know how to get out of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so because the other person is texting so furiously and so fast and including other people and it's very oh. overwhelming. I mean these conflicts go down very quickly between teens, you know, whether it's text or social media, they just they happen very very quickly and get out of control very quickly. So step 1 is taking it um offline and taking it face to face and learning how to say you know, I teach kids all the time how to use I statements and to just say, when you shared that screenshot, I felt mm. really embarrassed and overwhelmed. Mm. And I wish that you didn't share that screenshot. You know, can you tell me why you scared, shared that screenshot? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other person probably will get defensive because one thing that is happening is that teenagers aren't taught how to handle conflict right. face-to-face. So they haven't really worked it out. They don't know what to do. They're also living in this time, and we have to remember this as the adults. We have put them in this position where everyone has to be a superstar. Everyone has to be the best. And that means somebody's the worst, you know, and when something goes wrong, there's always someone to blame. That's kind of the messaging that kids are getting from a young age on up. I see it in sports. I see it in theater. I see it all the time where, Mm. well, because of that person, it didn't go right. And Mm. we have to stop that. Blame is useless. You know, blame is useless. We can work through things together. We can talk about what went wrong. I say to teenagers all the time. You, even if something is 98% someone else's fault, you have got to own your 2%. Yes. And you do that by saying, I'm sorry that I did this. Right. Here's how I feel about that. Mm-hmm. And so they have to have practice with that. And that starts at home. Mm-hmm. And parents can really role play things with their teenagers. I do it in session all the time. Um, but parents could do this at home where, okay, tell me what the problem was. What was the conflict that happened that you didn't know how to handle? We're going to go back to the beginning step by step and we're going to role play it and you be you the first time but the second time I'm going to be you and you're going to be your friend and we'll switch roles and that way we can have empathy for each other and try to think about what the other person might have been thinking. But this was kind of I mean it's sort of similar to one of the things you talked about in your workbook which is like uh, my concept of uh, a do-over I don't remember what you called it but almost like you you get to go back and say what you wished you said in that situation right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and funny, you know, I was watching a Seinfeld episode the other night where <laughs> George was coming up with all these comebacks after the fact. No. And, oh, I wish I said that. I wish I said that. But, you know, I think we all go through this. I and mean, I think teenagers go through this a lot where it's really hard in the moment to think of the clear thoughts that you want to convey. Oh, yes. And so sometimes things just pop out of your mouth and then you regret it, you mm-hmm. know. But we, the great thing about being human is that we can go back and say, I'm sorry that I said that. Yes, I I wish I I said. said Yeah, I wish I said this instead. And I'm sorry because I know that what I said hurt you. Now, we may not get forgiveness right away. We may not get it in one day or three days or one month. But we can own it and we can apologize for our role in it. And we can try to learn from it and do better from there. Ooh, so good, Katie. That is exactly right on. I, I, I think that that step is so often missed uh, because we think to ourselves, well, even if I do say that, it may not help. Well, it may not help right away, as you're saying. And perhaps that person does become, you know, more distant from you and you don't get the relationship that you wanted. But it, it takes something off of you a bit, doesn't it? It kind of it does. changes yeah. the way that you sit in your own body because you've done what you needed to do to put it to rest as much as you can. And now, yes, the ball is in the other person's court. But maybe, you know, it's going to be months from then or years later, that person comes back to you and says, um, you know, you were you were really brave to do that. And I, I should have been more forgiving or, or whatever it might be. Uh, it might not happen right away, as you said, but it could happen in the future. And even if it doesn't, you can sit strong knowing that you did what you needed to do. And on the flip side of that, too, is when people come to us for forgiveness, mm-hmm. you know, and, and come to apologize for something, I, I find myself saying to teenagers a lot, you know, forgiveness does not mean just saying, okay, everything's fine yes. now. You know, forgiveness is giving yourself permission to let go yes. that that thing doesn't have to take up a whole file folder in your brain anymore. You know, right. now it can be gone. Now it can be mm-hmm. over and you can move on. And the friendship may take time to repair Um, But, you know, forgiveness is just leaving the door open a tiny crack, but letting go of it so that you are not burdened by it anymore. Mm, 
Good point on that. Um, that forgiveness thing is a is a tough step, and I think so often we aren't taught exactly about that. Um, we we bury things under the rug and move on, but it's still occupying our brain, as you're saying, and and uh, that's not healthy for anyone. So you give some exercises that allow teens to show gratitude. You talk about journaling, um, creating a mantra that uh, can assist them during the day. Can you tell us how we can approach our teens and help them to do some of these positive things for themselves that they can really do for their whole life? Right. Well, you know, and it's funny because one of the big reasons I did jump at the chance to write this book, and, and this happened even just the other day as a teen client was leaving my office. But, you know, if you're a parent of a teen, you know that they don't always take your feedback, but often they will take someone else's, which is a frustrating part. So of frustrating. You're like, a I, teen I said a, you know, that exact thing. Mom said to me the other day, I just said this I just to said him that. Yes. yesterday, but yeah. because you said it, it's gold. It's genius. <laughs> By the way, Katie Hurley is a genius and mom right. has no idea what she's talking no idea. about. Yeah. Yes. So, and I kind of laughed and I said, you know, I think the thing is though, as teens are working toward individuation, it's good for them to have other adults they can mm-hmm. trust yes. and that they can okay. check in with for information and get good, you know, solid information and strategies. So that's one of the reasons I put these things into a book because parents can hand it off mm-hmm. and say, hey, talk to me about what you're learning in it, but you teach me. Right. Um, but it is, you know, we know research shows that gratitude is really important in terms of our mental health and happiness and just feeling calm and good. And often it gets overlooked. You know, I always joke that we do this weird thing in the United States where we're always super grateful in November because of Thanksgiving. And then the rest of the year, we're like, eh. I'm really stressed out. Yes. Um, right. We have like each, you see those people on Facebook, like each yeah. day is devoted to being days. grateful to something. Yes. And it's it's yeah. great, but it's like, well, but what about the other 11 months? Yes. Because, Good you know, point. it's not a, it's not a one month thing. So Um, I think, you know, the other thing research consistently shows is that journaling is a really powerful exercise for Mm -hmm. people of all ages in terms of just thinking um, about gratitude and and what makes us keep going. And so with teenagers, I often ask them to maybe do journal exercises where they write down, I'll say, do your your best and worst of the day, you know, because we can't ignore the worst because it takes up brain space. Yes. But if we write it down, we get it out and then it doesn't have to take up brain space. So I'll say, you know, write the three worst things that happened today. Just write those down and then take a few deep breaths. And after that, sit, you know, close your eyes and just breathe deeply and think about, well, what today makes you grateful? And it doesn't, the, the problem, the thing we do with gratitude that makes people not want to practice it, practice it, excuse me, is that we always make it these big things. Oh, yes. You know, it has to be these big things. You know what? You are allowed to be grateful for a Hershey's kiss yes. that tastes really good today. Yes. Like, I would be it. grateful for that right now. Right. That sounds so, good. We have to teach young people that you can be grateful for the small Mm -hmm. little things, the butterfly that flew by your face and made you stop and think for a second. Mm -hmm. Like just those are the things, those little small moments add up to big feelings of gratitude over time. So those are the things we want to kind of check in with. Um, And, you know, in terms of mantras, I just, I do it all the time for myself. And so teenagers always like, they roll their eyes at me at first when I talk about it, but then they'll let, you know, we'll joke and we'll come up with absurd mantras that don't make any sense. But then we'll kind of talk about like, well, what's your tagline? Like have a tagline that makes you feel good about yourself or like you can conquer the day or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever Doing the is. best I can. <laughs> yeah. I can handle whatever comes my way yes. today. You know, I got this, you know, can be simple things and, um, you know, put it in your profile on Instagram, like mm-hmm. make it your thing, have a tagline that helps inspire you as you get through the day. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes it's just thinking about those little lines that remind us that, yeah, you know what, right now is hard. This moment is really, really hard, but I've been through hard things before and I can get through hard things again. Mm, mm. 
Oh, I, I mean, I feel like I feel that in my body and I just love that so much. And and for those people who are listening who have younger kids, it's a great thing to start early because they're not going to be quite as sassy about it, right? I mean, they can, right. they can really grab on to a mantra and and say some pretty, you know, uh, profound things. Um, yeah. and, and that could help take a ride through the teenage years a little bit easier. Um, but of course, that can change over time as well. Um, so you don't have to wait till the teen years to create that mantra. That's something we could do right away. And I love that. So I like the practical tip of reframing negative thoughts into realistic thoughts. In fact, that was the picture that I put up on Instagram last night, um, in my stories, because I, I just think it's, I think it's something that teens and adults do so often is that the negative thought that we have in our head becomes our truth when actually it may be completely devoid of truth. So can you help us to understand the difference between a negative thought in our head and then the realistic thought that really we should be thinking about? Give us some examples and and maybe some insight into how this transformation from negative thought to realistic thoughts can help teens who are coping with the ups and downs of moods or actually coping with depression? Well, so one thing we know about teens is they tend to zoom in on small things that happen. And those small things take up a lot of space in their thoughts because they get stuck in this negative thought loop. And then one unfortunate thing that I feel like has happened just in the world in general is people do this thing where they're like, just think positive, Mm. you know, say something positive. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when you're really bogged down with something negative, it's really exceptionally difficult to just blurt out and believe something positive. So for me, I'm always saying, let's, let's be realistic. Okay, instead of trying to reframe a negative into this happy, sunshiny positive, let's reframe it into realistic. So for example, if a teenager is coming home from school, and they let's say they bombed their English test, you know, for whatever reason, they just what's the silver lining? (laughs) You know, yeah, right. (laughs) Tell me something positive. Tell me something positive about bombing that test. At least I've learned. Scenario. (laughs) So, you know, I'll say to them like, okay, all right, yeah, own it, own that negative thought. Like, uh, I, I, I'm failing English. I'm gonna fail English. I'm failing English. So let's talk about that. But let's zoom out. And let's reframe it and let's say, okay, so that's one grade. You bombed this test. You, you definitely spectacularly bombed this <laughs> test. It did not go well. Let's, we're going to own that for a second and talk about it. But let's zoom out. What other things have you turned in so far this semester? Well, I turned in a paper and I got a B on that. And I, you know, I got a C on this and I got a B plus on that. Like, let's zoom out and let's look at the whole arc of English right now this semester. And let's say, hey, are you really failing English or... Did I struggle with one test and I'm going to go to the teacher and get extra help and Mm. see where I can go from there? Mm. So, you know, like instead of getting stuck in, I'm failing English. This is a disaster. I'm going to be grounded. My parents are going to be so mad at me and disappointed. Let's get out of that thought process and reframe it and say, I've been doing pretty well in English all along. I struggled with this one thing, but I can get extra help. Yes, that feels much better than I'm not going to get into college. I'll never get a job in my life and I'll right. die alone. Because so, that's where it goes. Yeah, it's, you it's know. absolutely where it goes. Yes. yes, because you bombed one English test. I love that. I think that is so practical. And I would definitely encourage people to do that like today. Um Since we're coming upon the end of the podcast, I'd love for you to finish this sentence. The one thing I really want people to know about depression and teens is... Depression feels very overwhelming and it's very hard to describe. So it makes it difficult for teenagers to communicate how they're actually feeling. It feels like this big cloud that's walking around with them and they just don't know how to put up the umbrella. Mm, That's so beautifully said. And I bet you people are really resonating with that who are struggling with depression, not just teens, but but anybody who's who's dealing with depression. And I do love that what you're saying through this workbook and through this podcast is that we are happy to be your umbrella like we what we are there to help you. 
and to help you put up your umbrella, to help you uh, put an umbrella up for you while you're dealing with this stuff so that you can get the help you need because it, everybody is worthy of getting some help. And in, while their kids are pushing us away and it feels like teens can be so angry and frustrated and sad and you might feel like you just don't know what to do, they can get help and depression can get better. Um, and the moods, you know, if it's not depression, are going to change and grow over time as well. So I think that's such a beautiful analogy and I so appreciate you bringing that up. Give us your top tip. What do you think, what do you want us to know and what do you want us to do and take away from this podcast today? Well, I think I want parents to know that they don't have to be scared of depression, that if they are worried about their kids, that they don't have to fear that this is going to change their lives forever. This is something that they're going through and it's something that is treatable. And, you know, parents everywhere are very fearful of the word suicide because we're hearing it a lot in the media right now. Mm. Um, But suicide is preventable. And so help is out there. And I think, you know, the other thing I want them to know is that we are living in a time where we're constantly being told because of media coverage of things like helicopter parenting and all the other words they come up with, we're constantly being told back off, you know, leave them, leave them be, let them figure things out. And so the message that the teens are getting is you got to figure this out on your own, but everybody needs help sometimes. So, you know, don't be afraid to step under the cloud with your teen and put up the umbrella for them. Mm -hmm. Eventually they'll learn how to do it alone, but right now they can't and they do need you and that's okay. This is a time when you should step in and be there to hold it up for them until they climb out and figure it out. So if you feel after listening to this podcast and reading your workbook that your child is depressed, I mean, clinically depressed, what would you want somebody who's listening in today to do right away? I would want them to call their primary care physician right away and say, I'd like to bring my son or daughter in for just for an extra checkup evaluation and talk about this and get some resources. Um, We do know that in some areas of the country, resources are pretty scarce, but primary care physicians have a way of connecting with the local hospitals and sourcing, you know, social workers and therapists and marriage and family therapists and all kinds of people. So um, don't stop, you know, Mm -hmm. keep asking. Not every school has a counselor on campus, but if they do, walk right in there and use it and don't be afraid. Mm, So good. Give us the resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you and your new workbook and your old books as well? Because they're still great. Well, everything is housed on my website, practicalkatie.com. And if you follow me on Instagram at Katie F. Hurley, I give lots of different tips and, and information from all of my books. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for for your insight and your strategies. I think what you've provided here is really important and uh, very helpful to so many people, whether you have a child who you believe is depressed or has been diagnosed with depression, or you have a teen that's just been going through some hard times and could need need some extra resources. uh, I think your tips and your tools can really help a lot of people. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. Well, many thank yous. I've got my takeaways and sweet friends, I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. You can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. I am also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. I will be going back and forth with Katie Hurley on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook with memes that I will create with her incredible quotes. I'm sure the umbrella one will be up there so we can share that all around. And if you love this podcast, like I did. I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so others can learn about these outstanding tools and solutions and use them in their own homes with their own kids. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts uh, are up there, and the show notes to this podcast and the previous ones I've done with Katie Hurley are up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. 
I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Perhaps you heard something today and you thought, oh, I should have known, I should have done, I should have said. Don't do that to yourself. You get, you're getting this information. You can apply it now. You can say you're sorry. You can do it differently. That's what we know from this podcast. There will always be moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity. But please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.